Africa, the cradle of humanity and that boundless reservoir of some of the Earth's most extensive natural resources. A spellbinding location that presents a panorama of majestic landscapes mingling amongst complex socio-economic challenges. This vast continent, teeming with varied ecosystems and rich in minerals, has been a focal point of global attention, not solely for its scenic beauty, but also for its deep-seated issues in governance and economy. However, unbeknownst to many, the extraction of Africa's abundant resources has been secretly controlled by a select few old money families, often hidden in plain sight. In particular, one such dynasty has dominated the global diamond industry in an era of unparalleled dominance, controlling an astonishing 85 to 90 percent of rough diamond distribution for over a hundred years, not only in Africa, but worldwide. Indeed, the reign of the Oppenheimer family of South Africa has managed to not only survive, but thrive through the most testing of historical eras. They've amassed billions through two world wars, the so-called digital revolution of the 21st century, and they even managed to escape the highly publicized blood diamond controversy of the early 2000s. In today's episode, we tell their full 120 year saga, a striking example of the rapacious centuries long fight over resources, political power, and global prestige in the birthplace of our species, as we describe the Oppenheimers the old money family that controls Africa. In the historical echelons of global wealth and influence, South Africa's Oppenheimer clan stands near the very top, living out a familial saga intertwined with the gleaming allure of diamonds, the strategic play of high finance and diversification into the most essential goods, including Africa's food supply itself. As of 2024, at the helm of this legendary lineage stands Nicholas F. Oppenheimer, endearingly known as Nicky, who, as of last year, boasts a net worth of a staggering $9.85 billion, and this makes him the 223rd richest person on Earth according to Bloomberg's Billionaires Index. And surprisingly, this financial prowess marks a notable climb of almost $2 billion from his $7.95 billion net worth just the year before, in 2022. Now, this particularly dramatic ascent in Nicky's fortune traces back to a pivotal moment in 2012, when he sold his family's 40% stake in the famed De Beers Diamond Company to Anglo-American Corporation for a hefty sum of 5.2 billion US dollars. You see, this masterstroke, supplemented by about $390 million in dividends, laid the cornerstone of Nicky Oppenheimer's diverse portfolio, one with a keen eye on commodities and African markets. Furthermore, Nikki's ventures span continents with private equity investments in Africa, Asia, the US and Europe, managed through Stockdale Street in London and Tana Africa Capital in Johannesburg. Indeed, these strategic investments have yielded lucrative returns, cementing his status as a titan in the realm of global business. And beyond the boardroom, Nikki's interests soar into the skies with Fireblade Aviation, established in 2014. This Johannesburg-based private aviation firm offers executive charter flights and VIP services, boasting a fleet of sophisticated aircraft catering to an elite clientele. Additionally, in the healthcare sector, Nikki holds a significant 3.37% stake in Integrated Diagnostics Holdings, expanding his influence into consumer healthcare across several countries. Yet Nikki's passion extends to environmental stewardship as well. He owns the Shangani Ranch, a vast 65,000 hectare property celebrated for its conservation efforts. And, along with his son and heir apparent Jonathan Oppenheimer, co-owns Tswalu Kalahari, South Africa's largest private game reserve. But the baton of the Oppenheimer legacy is soon poised to pass to the aforementioned Jonathan Oppenheimer, Nicky's son. Having first honed his skills at NM Rothschild & Sons, yes, those Rothschilds, then Anglo-American Corporation, as well as his family's historical flagship company De Beers, Jonathan's prowess in commercial endeavors is unmistakable. Indeed, his tenure as managing director of De Beers Consolidated Mines in South Africa underscored his business acumen. And, extending his global stature, Jonathan joined the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace's Board of Trustees in 2018, demonstrating his political policy savvy. Furthermore, in 2023, Jonathan made a strategic move by taking control of Nigeria's GZ Industries Limited, 
signaling his ambition to shape the beverage can industry in sub-Saharan Africa. Additionally, Rebecca Oppenheimer, arguably the family's big brain, adds another dimension to the Oppenheimer saga. Raised in Manhattan's Upper West Side and a graduate of Columbia University and Caltech, Rebecca's contributions to astrophysics are well known. Having co-discovered the first brown dwarf and pioneered the study of exoplanetary atmospheres, Rebecca has earned numerous accolades in the scientific community and even owns a palatial 8,462-square-foot residence, Merkaba in Washington State, designed to look like a UFO. And, par for the old money course, the Oppenheimer's display of wealth includes Nikki's collection of luxury automobiles, a yacht, a private jet, and properties spanning Johannesburg to Berkshire, alongside the majestic Tswalu Kalahari Private Game Reserve. However, how did a family of bookish scientists and corporate natural resource financiers arrive at multi-billionaire status in the 21st century without needing to go the Musk or Zuckerberg route of leveraging technology to amass an eye-watering fortune? In order to find our answer, we'll have to turn back the hands of time and venture below the smoke-filled industrial skies of 19th century Germany. The first patriarch of what would become the diamond-dominating Oppenheimer family, Ernest Oppenheimer, emerged into the world on the 22nd of May, 1880, in Friedberg, German Empire, to a Jewish family. Born to Edward Oppenheimer, a cigar merchant, and Nanette, nay Hirschhorn, Ernest's early life was steeped in the cultural and economic milieu of his time. You see, the 1880s in Friedberg were characterized by a complex social fabric, with Jewish families like the Oppenheimers contributing significantly to the local economy. And while not all cigar merchants amassed great wealth, the Oppenheimer family appeared to have enjoyed a comfortable life. Indicative of the steady prosperity found in such trades, young Ernest embarked on his professional journey at 17, joining Dunkelspuler Company, a London-based diamond brokerage. Soon, his astute understanding of the diamond trade and unerring eye for detail did not go unnoticed, and at 22, he was dispatched to South Africa, a land, even back then, rich with diamond reserves, to act as a buyer for his company in the city of Kimberley. You see, in those days, Kimberley, the destination of his assignment, was far more than a mere mining town. It was a burgeoning economic hub in South Africa, and its significance in the early 20th century cannot be understated. For example, in a move that signaled its advanced infrastructure and modernity, Kimberley lit its streets with electric lights on the 2nd of September, 1882. This achievement marked it as the first city in the Southern Hemisphere and the second globally, following Philadelphia in the United States, to adopt this innovation. The city's economic prowess was further underscored by the establishment of the first stock exchange in Africa in 1881, a development that was a clear indicator of Kimberley's central role in the continent's burgeoning economic landscape, particularly in the mining sector. With this in mind, Ernest Oppenheimer would later deftly finesse his way into the growing city's corridors of influence, engaging in its political sphere with the same acumen he applied to business. Indeed, Ernest went so far as to become mayor of Kimberley, South Africa, from 1912 to 1950. And yet, prior to that, for a young man in his mid-twenties, such rapid ascent in the diamond industry was impressively uncommon. Although during this period, the Jewish diamond market in South Africa was burgeoning and offered ample opportunities for astute businessmen like Ernest, his otherworldly rise was a reflection of the soon-to-be characteristic foresight of an Oppenheimer. Therefore, from the very beginning of their dominance of Africa's resource markets, it would seem that the family had the Midas touch when it came to economic and political intrigue. Furthermore, during this period, Ernest's personal life took a fortuitous turn in 1906, when he married Mary Lena Pollock from London. This union not only marked a new chapter in his life, but also played a pivotal role in the Oppenheimer family's integration into South African society and the mining community. And the birth of their son, Harry Oppenheimer, in 1912, the same year Father Ernest was elected mayor, set the stage for the continuation of the family's influence in the diamond industry. Harry would later follow in his father's footsteps, taking the helm of De Beers. But first, the Oppenheimers would have to demonstrate to themselves and the world if they could not only survive, but thrive through coming back-to-back -back world wars that would change everything. 
In the aftermath of World War I, South Africa found itself in a geopolitical maelstrom. This period marked the emergence of Ernest Oppenheimer, a journey into the sparkling realm of African gems, grabbed not merely by chance, but as a strategic move shaped by the tumultuous global and local politics of the time. The year 1917 saw Oppenheimer, in partnership with William Lincoln Honnold, an American engineer of considerable repute, launch the Anglo-American Corporation. This venture, which would soon become a cornerstone in the diamond industry, was significantly backed by none other than the legendary financier and political powerhouse J.P. Morgan. You see, Morgan's interest in Africa, and particularly in its diamond mines, was rooted in a strategic vision. Recognizing the continent's untapped wealth and the growing global demand for diamonds, Morgan saw an opportunity to expand his multi-billion dollar financial empire into new, resource-rich territories. And two years after its inception, Oppenheimer and Morgan's Anglo-American made a bold move by purchasing diamond mines in southwest Africa. This was not just a business transaction, it was a direct challenge to the De Beers Diamond Monopoly, a company that had long held an unshakable grip on the diamond market. At this point, Anglo-American, with an initial capital of £1 million, had established a solid financial foundation, drawing investments from the United States, England and South Africa. Furthermore, around this same time, in 1921, Ernest was knighted by King George V of England for his services during World War I. You see, he played a significant role in supporting the war effort, which included helping to establish the Kimberley Regiment and organizing the labor required to build a railway line from Eupington in the Northern Cape to the Namibian border. His contributions to the British war effort were thus recognized with the honor of knighthood, despite the challenges he faced due to anti-German sentiment at the time, as he was of German origin. Leveraging this newly minted influence, Ernest ventured further into the political arena, securing a seat in the South African House of Assembly in 1924 as the member for Kimberley, a position he held until 1938. However, the year 1927 marked Oppenheimer's pièce de résistance when he took control of his main competitor, the late Cecil Rhodes de Beers Empire, laying the groundwork for a global monopoly over the diamond trade, and by 1929 he had ascended to the chairmanship of de Beers. His strategy was then clear, establish market monopolies, control diamond pricing and supply channels, and create an artificial scarcity to keep prices soaring. But World War II presented new challenges and opportunities for Oppenheimer and De Beers. Amidst global conflict, accusations surfaced against Oppenheimer for withholding industrial diamonds crucial for the US war effort. However, his strategic foresight led to the establishment of diamond-cutting factories in South Africa, ensuring a steady supply of diamonds even as Europe was engulfed in war. In the effervescent post-World War II era, Oppenheimer's De Beers, already a titan in the diamond industry, branched out, injecting its burgeoning profits into the development of gold mines across South Africa. And this wasn't the end of its expansionist zeal. De Beers soon dipped its toes into industries as varied as platinum, steel and even paper products. However, Oppenheimer's tenure wasn't without its share of controversies, and one significant issue was price-fixing. You see, in the 1930s, Ernest maneuvered De Beers into a formidable global cartel, a strategy that not only revived the diamond industry, but also set a precedent that lasted well beyond his time. His crafty price manipulation practices were so effective that they drew the attention of legal authorities, leading to a hefty $10 million fine for De Beers in an Ohio court. Another point of contention was Oppenheimer's adherence to antitrust principles, in other words, forming a monopoly. Indeed, De Beers' operations were seen as a direct contravention of US antitrust laws, specifically the Sherman Act and Clayton Act, which were designed to ensure competition and protect consumer welfare. By eliminating competition and controlling the diamond supply, De Beers was able to keep prices artificially high, which ultimately harmed consumer welfare. To combat these contentious issues, Ernest Oppenheimer began to engage in an intensely proactive philanthropic strategy. Indeed, his donations spanned many sectors, stretching from the establishment of an engineering department at the University of Stellenbosch to funding a center for colonial research at Oxford University. However, Ernest Oppenheimer's philanthropic and economic ventures, as grand as they were, merely set the stage for what was to come. 
Our story now turns to meet his son, Harry Oppenheimer, where a tempest of wealth, power and personal drama awaits, promising to arguably eclipse even his own father's monumental legacy. Harry Frederick Oppenheimer, born in Kimberley, South Africa, on the 28th of October 1908, was seemingly preordained for a vital role in his family's empire. Following his graduation from the esteemed University of Oxford in England, Harry Oppenheimer returned to South Africa and joined the ranks of his father's renowned company, Anglo-American. His corporate progression, however, was temporarily interrupted by World War II, during which he served in the South African Corps in North Africa. In the post-war era, Harry Oppenheimer was drawn into the realm of politics. From 1948 to 1957, he represented the United Party as a member of the South African Parliament, where he became known for his strong opposition to the apartheid regime. You see, this period in South African history was deeply affected by the institutionalization of apartheid, a system of racial segregation and discrimination. The pro-apartheid National Party, victorious in the 1948 elections, had by then enacted laws such as the Population Registration Act of 1950, which categorized South Africans by race and implemented strict segregation through various acts. During his time in Parliament, Harry Oppenheimer, as a member of the opposition, emerged as a notable figure against the regime. As a member of Parliament for the United Party, the main opposition to the National Party's apartheid policies, he advocated for a more equal treatment of black South Africans. However, his approach, while advocating for better conditions, did not extend to full equality for all races. On one hand, Oppenheimer's efforts were aimed at enhancing the lives of black urban residents and fostering the development of a property-owning black middle class, an approach seen as a step towards an orderly political transition. On the other hand, purposefully aligning himself with the legacy of British colonialist and businessman Cecil Rhodes, Harry expressed concerns about the potential risks to civilization he associated with what Oppenheimer referred to as primitive tribesmen. This duality in his views reflected the complexities of his position and the era's socio-political landscape. However, by 1957, the family business called. Following his father's demise that year, Harry relinquished his political ambitions to spearhead both Anglo-American and De Beers. And indeed, De Beers, by then a titan in diamond and mineral supply, was poised for a transformation under his aegis. At De Beers, Harry Oppenheimer was more than a mere executive. He was a visionary. He revolutionized the diamond industry with ingenious marketing tactics, paving the way for the modern connotation of diamonds as enduring emblems of love and commitment and a girl's best friend. Naturally, his strategy wasn't just effective, it was transformative, shaping global perceptions that persist today. And under his leadership, De Beers' footprint expanded dramatically, reaching Canada, Australia, Malaysia, Portugal, Zambia, and Tanzania. This expansion was not just a growth strategy, but a statement of intent, firmly planting De Beers on the global stage. However, although he had formally left politics years before, Harry's political influence continued to hold sway. He seamlessly transitioned to a role behind the scenes, supporting the Progressive Party as its chief financial benefactor, thus continuing to shape the political landscape without the limelight of office. By the time the 1980s dawned, Oppenheimer had climbed the echelons of wealth, ranking among the world's richest. His fortune, a mosaic of gold, diamonds and various minerals, was a testament to his business acumen. As the chairman of both the Anglo-American Corporation and De Beers Consolidated Mines, he didn't just oversee operations, he expanded their global footprint, so much so that by the end of the decade, his empire shockingly contributed to a full quarter of South Africa's GDP. As his unparalleled career came to a close, Harry had set the stage for his son, Nicky Oppenheimer, to take the reins and steer the family legacy through a world of evolving challenges and opportunities. In the dynamic decade of the 1990s, the Oppenheimer family, with Nicholas Nicky Oppenheimer at the helm, maintained their stronghold over the diamond industry. Their control of De Beers since the late 1920s had transformed diamonds into emblems of luxury and desire. Yet this reign was not without its challenges, and in 1995, the family yet again found themselves embroiled in controversy. 
Critics accuse them of monopolistic practices, alleging that their grip over De Beers and its exclusive contracts allowed them to skew the diamond market. Thus, as the 21st century unfolded, the Oppenheimers pivoted, broadening their business interests beyond the glint of diamonds. They ventured into various African sectors, including healthcare, agriculture, media, and retail. This strategic diversification was seen as a savvy move to safeguard the family's financial prominence and influence, especially as they gradually stepped back from the diamond sphere. However, the new millennium further brought intensified scrutiny to the Oppenheimer's diamond endeavors. Criticisms centered around environmental and ethical concerns, gaining momentum with cultural references that cast a spotlight on the darker aspects of diamond mining. One such reference was the Oscar-nominated 2006 film Blood Diamond, starring Leonardo DiCaprio. Set amidst the Sierra Leone Civil War, the movie graphically depicted the harrowing realities of diamond mining, starkly portraying the industry's impact on local communities and the environment heightened consumer consciousness about the moral complexities of the trade. Simultaneously, controversial rapper Kanye West's 2005 song Diamonds from Sierra Leone echoed similar themes, illuminating the grim abuses of Sierra Leone's diamond mines and adding momentum in pop culture to speaking out against the monopolistic diamond trade. Subsequently, both the film and the song were instrumental in elevating public awareness of the ethical dilemmas in diamond mining, leading to increased scrutiny, including those of companies under the Oppenheimer umbrella. This cultural and ethical awakening marked a significant shift in how the world viewed the glittering allure of diamonds, casting a shadow on the practices that brought them to market. Then, in 2012, the diamond industry witnessed a pivotal moment as the Oppenheimer family relinquished their 40% stake in De Beers to Anglo-American. This deal, valued at over $5 billion, saw the Oppenheimer's storied 80-year reign at De Beers come to a close. However, as previously noted, Anglo-American itself was founded by an Oppenheimer family member, thus raising questions of if the lineage has really ever left the trade. Anglo-American thus upped its share in De Beers to a dominant 85%, heralding a new era in the glittering world of diamonds. And this transaction was more than a mere business deal. It signaled a strategic pivot for the Oppenheimer family. With a newfound liquidity, the family, already known for its diverse investments, was now poised to broaden its portfolio across various sectors. Thus, in an intriguing turn of events, the Oppenheimers entered Nigeria's fast food scene in 2015. This move, tapping into a market expanding by 4% annually, highlighted their agility in recognizing burgeoning opportunities. And the family's foray into this sector resonated with Nigeria's growing appetite for fine dining and quick service. 2017 marked a further strategic move in this arena by the Oppenheimers in Nigeria with the acquisition of a majority stake in GZ Industries, a leading aluminium can manufacturer. GZ Industries, boasting an annual production of 3 billion cans, became a cornerstone in the Oppenheimer's investment portfolio, further entrenching their influence in Africa's largest economy. Fast forward to 2023, and the Oppenheimer's investments in Nigeria's food and beverage packaging sectors have significantly shaped the market dynamics. Their stake in GZ Industries has propelled the company to control a substantial portion of Nigeria's drinks can market. Thus, by the 2020s, the Oppenheimer dynasty has firmly established its complex and multifaceted legacy, stretching from diamonds and precious gems to aluminum. Their story reflects what happens when one family permanently embeds itself in the economic and political structures of Africa's vast natural resources, for better or for worse. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. What is your opinion on the Oppenheimer family legacy? This video was requested by many subscribers and we've been glad to help work on topics you're interested in. Thanks for your continued viewership with us and cheers until next time.